My name is Michael Lasasa. I'm a sophomore here at Westfield State University, majoring in communications and political science. I aspire to be a political filmmaker, and as such, I'm particularly excited to help introduce today's community conversation entitled Governing in 2022, Giving Voice to All. We'll be exploring the political landscapes and how they've changed in Western Massachusetts. We'll look at whether the increasing diversity of our population is reflected in our elected officials. And we'll discuss what changes we might expect in the upcoming years. Let me introduce you to our panelists. First is Betty Medina Lichtenstein. Ms. Lichtenstein is a familiar face in the city of Holyoke where she led Enlace de Familia for 27 years before retiring last year. And Lasse de Familia is a nonprofit organization known for its commitment and advocacy on behalf of the Puerto Rican community. Also from Holyoke is Councillor Israel Rivera. Councillor Rivera is a newly elected Holyoke City Councillor at large and is a current graduate student in Westfield State's Masters in Public Administration program. Next is State Representative Orlando Ramos. Representative Ramos was born and raised in Springfield and represents portions of Springfield and Chicopee. He's a graduate of Putnam High, Springfield Technical Community College, the University of Massachusetts, and just recently, his master's in public administration from Westfield State. Also with us is State Representative Bud Williams. Representative Williams chairs the Joint Committee on Racial Equity, Civil Rights, and Inclusion, and he serves on the Ways and Means Committee. In addition to receiving his undergraduate degree in education from Westfield State, he was the university's most recent recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award. And finally, we have with us Westfield State University Professor Charles DiStefano. Dr. DiStefano is the director of Westfield's Master's in Public Administration program and teaches courses in political analysis and public management skills. I would now like to turn it over to the president of Westfield State University, Dr. Linda Thompson. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for being here this evening. You know, I wanted to first uh, ask a question of Betty. You ran for the Holyoke School Committee and became the first Puerto Rican elected official in the state. What was your motivation and what was that experience like? The motivation um, was twofold. One of them was that the, um, the, the school committee member at that time had actually moved out of the district. And in Holyoke, um, we go by wards. And he had um, continued to run um, for a, as a school committee member in a ward that he no longer lived in. And so when that um, came up um, as information, um, people started to approach and we started to have those conversations about the possibility of myself running. The second one is this is that I had children in the public schools and I saw um, as it is a lot today many inequities and issues that needed to be addressed. Um, at the time um, there were no other people of color on city council or on school committee and I took that basically as my springboard. Great. The next question, I'm going to start with Betty, but I'd love all of you to respond to it as well. And so I'd love to, for you all to share with me your thoughts on how the uh, political landscape has been transformed over the, over the last few decades, and what are the challenges to get people to get out and vote? Mm -hmm. That's a very challenging question, <laughs> <laughs> but I will try my best to be able to respond to it. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have changed since the 1980s, um, and there have been many people that have run, uh, some unsuccessfully, but that they raised issues um, on, in their platform to be able to have voices heard um, that typically are not heard, and also people that uh, ran successfully. So although um, many things have changed from the 1980s to now, um, I mean, right now, you know, I look across and with lots of pride um, as being as the oldest person here, um, <laughs> and uh, also someone that ran in the early 80s, 
things are changing. Um, the brilliant minds are there. Um, people that know how to connect and how to bring the people's issues to the table and to find resolve, right? Because it's all about moving it forward. I'll stop there. Okay. Um, uh <laughs> I was just, how has the political landscape so been transformed yeah. over the last few decades, and what are the challenges to get people out to vote? So, uh, I guess for me, um, it's changed, and we got new in Holyoke, at least, right, and in, in, in Springfield, too, as well. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, there's a, a, a diverse council now, right, and different ideas, uh, different backgrounds. Um, compared to what it used to be for me as a kid growing up, right? Um, I remember, I mean, there's still a couple of members on the council that have been there since I was a child, right? But um, ultimately, we have, I have myself on the council, um, a, a colleague, uh, Tessa murphy Rambaletti, that I played baseball with her brother on the council as well. So then we also have Jose Maldonado, who was, um, actually one of my kids in the Boys and Girls Club <laughs> when I worked at the Boys and Girls Club. Sure. So ultimately, like now there's way more diverse, more representation overall on the council than I feel like there was back then. And that's part of one of the reasons why I ran. Um, yeah. And getting people out to vote. So getting people out mm -hmm. to vote has been a challenge, especially in the lower wards. I grew mm -hmm. up in the flats. Mm -hmm. For me, I feel like that's one of the reasons why I ran. Um, and with Josh running, um, our mm -hmm. new mayor, uh, we grew up together at the Boys and Girls Club. He's from South Holyoke. I'm from the Flats. Our thing on the campaign trail was to try to get more people from our communities out because that would actually tip the scales. Um, and it kind of did. Now, do we want it to be better? Yes. Um, moving forward, are we going to work towards getting more people out? Yes. I think that it's, it's working and that the, 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 what's it called? The narrative is altering little mm -hmm. by little. Mm -hmm. So Representative Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, I want, how has the political landscape been transformed over the past few decades, and what are the challenges of getting people out to vote? Some of the transformation you're looking at, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, right before our eyes, mm -hmm. but I must give, uh, pay homage to folks mm -hmm. like Betty, Ben Swan, Raymond Jordan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul Mason in Springfield, Mo Jones, who really laid the foundation mm -hmm. for the next and the next and the next generation. And uh, before Barack Obama, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before uh, Governor Patrick Duvall, mm -hmm. those were our role models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We stand on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. We stand on their shoulders. And the transformation is, you're looking at it. Sure. Representation, city, uh, mayor, polio, uh, Hispanic descent. And uh, that's, that's very refreshing. We have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, part of the problem, uh, as I see in terms of engaging voters, is that people have been so disappointed in the political process for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at our communities, some communities are, are worse now than they were back in the 80s, mm -hmm. or remain the same. Sure. So uh, how do you take that narrative and transform it to hope. Mm -hmm. right. It's it's very difficult uh, when folks the unemployment in most of our urban communities, especially the gateway cities, are very high. Mm -hmm. The health disparities are, are mm. out, out of whack. Sure. The uh, uh, wealth equity is is just it's just ballooned. So we have to take that narrative, and it's it's uh, and the communities that we represent very difficult. And Betty was there. Uh, we watched her over the years and the amazing work that uh, she'd done as an advocate, her and the people like Barbara Rivera, who was, who was in Springfield, mm -hmm. and Common Cita Jones. But those folks did it without elected officials. Mm -hmm. And they did a pretty good job. Sure. Because they would engage the system. And Ben Swan had a saying, he, mm -hmm. he talked about, uh, you know, any great person is always called an agitator. Dr. King was an <laughs> agitator. An agitator. But, but okay. the old washing machines, and I'm dating myself, uh, they always had the agitator in the machine <laughs> because what? He gets out the dirt. Sure. So I will stop with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Could, do you want to answer some of that as well? Thank sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think the story in the city of Springfield is similar to where my brother uh, described in, in the city of Holyoke, right? I mean, there is transformation that has, has happened. 
but only recently, right? So I was, when I was elected to city council in 2013, I was part of the first ever minority majority council in the city of Springfield. Oh. We had 13 oh. members, mm -hmm. and at the time we had seven people of color serving sure. the council. At the same time, we had the majority of the school committee for the first time ever who, um, who were people of color. I was elected to the state house in, in 2020, and for the first time mm -hmm. ever, now we have uh, four state legislators from the city of Springfield who are people of color that are representing us in, uh, in the general court. Again, something that's never happened, should have happened a long time ago, but sure. we're finally here. So the landscape has changed uh, pretty significantly over the last few years. The second part of your question is a little bit more of a loaded question. I, I know. <laughs> um, and I don't think that we have enough time to talk about all the details, but I will tell you this, one of the most important things that we need to do to get voter turnout is to make voting easy. Sure. We saw the impact that mailing voting had in communities of color across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So those are sort of the initiatives that we need to support. Sure. So Professor, <laughs> could you share with us, uh, you've heard the, the, the comments already by our elected officials, you know, what is it that we as a uh, university can do in order to increase representation? And I that whole question that I ask about getting more people to understand that voting is important. Yes, definitely. Um, so working with students and uh, they can be the thought where, well, the people, are they representing me? And having someone who is running for office who you feel understands who you are, represents you, that's important. Uh, bringing people together. So we've actually had events on campus where we brought local politicians and uh, to converse with the students. So the students get to know who is representing them and the representatives get to see what the student issues are. So that's really gonna help, um, help get the students engaged. And if they're engaged as voters, then they're gonna eventually be thinking, well, what can I do besides voting? Yeah. And find out ways where they can run for office or otherwise uh, be part of the solution, be part of the process. Sure. You know, today we, uh, uh, we had the election of the first mm. African-American woman to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. <laughs> and I'm so happy about that, let me just first say. <laughs> but you know, the, 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 the question I would pose to each one of you, what has happened that there, uh, you know, that you have a, a, a woman who was so well qualified and you had this total division between the, uh, the two, uh, the Republican and Democratic Party. How do we, uh, as, a, um, as a society, uh, begin to look at quality of the people and not, uh, and not try to vilify the, the person? I just, um, you know, I'll just start with you, and then you, Professor, and then we'll move on because I, I have been following this, mm -hmm. this um, because I've been so proud, but you know, and, 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 I, and I saw the daughter looking on as her mother was questioned and the look in her eyes mm -hmm. and then the tears that, that the mom had. I, I, you know, I just, you know, I was there with her. So, you know, how do we, how do we try to bridge the, the divide between people right now? Good question. Mm -hmm. As a citizens, we need to demand better of our elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, it's a toxic environment. Uh, we see it more federally. We don't always see it as much state and locally, but it is um, this idea that uh, we're, we're fighting each other when we can't have quality disagreements, but we can still engage and find compromise. That's how the nation was built. Um, so demanding more of our politicians and also, now that she is on the bench, um, we're gonna see what a great job she's doing, and that's gonna show well, she does deserve to be there. And we do deserve to have a more diverse representation in all our branches of government. Sure. I'll start over here with you, with you Betty, because, oh, you know, yeah. as a female, oh. I know you must be, I, oh. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming. Over the moon. <laughs> over the moon is the only thing I could say. Um, we wouldn't have enough time to, to listen to my opinions and beliefs about <laughs> the Republicans and the Democratic Party. But the way I look at it is, is that, um, and again, it is my opinion um, and my belief, is, is that this country was built on 
racism, slavery, prejudice, mm -hmm. control, oppression. And that many of families, generations, have been raised to believe in that, mm -hmm. to be able to stay in control, to be able to, um, and you know, during our last, um, how can I say this diplomatically, right? Um, <laughs> uh, the last leadership basically gave permission right. for people to come out um, and voice and act um, in ways that, for some of us, we believe that that is not okay in this country. We are real quick to point fingers at other countries, but we ourselves are not in a place where there is equity and there is shared power. And so I think that that played itself out during that inquisition um, that took place there. I'll stop there. Mm. <laughs> you have to follow that. You know? No. <laughs> uh, so for me, it, I, I, I keep, as it was going on, I kept on turning on the TV every once in a while. I don't watch TV that much. I mostly play video games and do homework. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever I have to do with city council and my job, um, but ultimately, when I would turn on the TV, it would be to check it out, right? Because I can't watch it, how they just would grill her for certain things and she's fully qualified for the job, for the position. And it kind of reminded me of when I was running for city council and I actually won, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I had another position and I had like a, a, a couple counselors who did not want me on the council because they felt like I shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, so they they... They took it upon themselves to uh, organize and 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 pretty much uh, try to ask for for me to resign from my school mm. position, um, as it being a conflict, right? So it becomes politics, right? And even though the person is qualified, the person is it has everything that is needed to be able to carry out the role in the position, the politics behind it get involved. People start peeling layers off. They start finding reasons as to why this person is not qualified or whatnot. They find all these, oh my God, it's crazy. It was just, it just became ridiculous to me at a certain point, right? Where you're just pointing out like little minutia details just to make your point. Um, and then you get to tear up someone's character at the same time and uh, there's like no recourse for it. So for, for me, um, I couldn't watch all of it, but I watched pieces and it was, it, it kind of speaks to the volume of, uh, of a female of color, right? Of what they have to go through. Um, for me, growing up for a single mother, with a single mother, it's like you go through the processes, and then even when you get to that point, you still got to get to the next level and impress sure. and still carry that level of like um, professionalism, quote unquote, because you never know when someone's coming to tear you down. Sure. Um, and that was on display right there. That was really on display, and I, you, you know, Representative Williams, I, you know, what is your spin on 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 the, the political landscape today, and it, even trying to get motivate it's, young it's people? What 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 young people are witnessing now mm -hmm. uh, is really shameful in the political process, and especially in Washington and some states. Mass isn't in that category as a state. There are other there are other states in the union that are really just as bad as Washington when it comes to turning back the hands of time on voting rights and, the, and, and all of that. But this, 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 this attitude, uh, is it a new attitude in America? Uh, it's something that's been percolating and resonating beneath the surface for a long time. When Barack Obama's elected president, um, there's a challenge to him by the former president saying that this is Bertha. Yeah. So America woke up one day and realized they elected a black man. And some were shocked and the reality didn't really hit. So they were able to take that positive in this country, because a lot of white folks voted for Barack Obama, take that positive in this country and they know the attitude of a lot of individuals, especially in the South that they had a slogan, let's make America great again. Mm -hmm. That's a code for black and brown people. You need to go back in your place. You know, go back to waiting tables and, and you know, uh, 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 working in grocery stores and, and, and washing dishes. 
So they were able to capitalize on that. And it, has, it, is, it is a divide in this country. It's like the Civil War has never, ever ended. Mm. It's the Civil War, it, mm. it goes. It, it's, it, it's very hard because, as Betty said, in terms of sharing power, equity, uh, jobs, uh, 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 making, putting folks at the table, you're in the room, but you want to be at the table. Uh, as that young man, I witnessed what they tried to do to him in Holyoke. Mm -hmm. that, that, I followed that, mm -hmm. what they did. He had a lot of courage, and, and, he, and he stayed, mm -hmm. he stuck with it. But that's mm -hmm. something we, we have to deal with in this country. That's, that's real, and if we don't be careful, these midterm elections, they're gonna flip the House, and they're gonna flip the Senate, because it looks like they're very much on track. Sure. And if that happens, we need to understand we, we're, 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 in a, we're in a real tough situation because uh, the Republicans, they play hard and they play for keeps and they want to take this country back. But folks like you and me as representatives don't need to be there. We need to be sweeping the floors or something. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll be quiet so, with that. So listening to that, Orlando, how do you... Um, how do you, you know, what is motivating, what motivated you in the first place to even think about running and, and how do we inspire? Because, you know, because I talk to, to young people and they say, I don't, I'm not involved, I don't like to get involved in politics at all. So everyone up here, you, 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 uh, you made that choice to do it. But, you know, what motivated you and how do we make a difference with the young people who are listening on sure. uh, on this, at this talk today? Well, I'll tell you this, that the lack of diversity was definitely uh, part of my motivation for running mm -hmm. for office. The fact that there weren't a lot of people who looked like me that were in those positions. Um, I was asked uh, a question, I, I, I believe I was in, in middle school, um, by one of my teachers who gave, me, gave us the assignment of writing about someone who inspired us and someone who we wanted to be like. Mm -hmm. That was the assignment. Who do you want to be like when you grow up? And I thought it through for a little bit. Um, I kind of let the, pla the, cast, the class kind of go by. She came over to my desk and she said, your, your paper is blank. Hmm. And I said, it is because I don't want to be like anybody. I want, I want, want to be myself. Sure. I want to be the first something. I don't want to be the next anything. I, and, I don't, and, and that was my message to a lot of young people, is don't be afraid to be the first something. Just because no one who looks like you has ever been there, doesn't mean that you can't be the first. That's great. For a great mm -hmm. comment. How do we inspire our uh, students to think that they uh, that they don't have to be in lockstep? You know, you can you can you don't necessarily have to walk the same way that everyone else is walking. How do we do that? Uh, it's funny in class. I I really encourage my students to uh, challenge everything, uh, to challenge what I'm saying, uh, hold me accountable, to have them to think for themselves, but to be able to back it up, to have the knowledge that they can. Uh, the site evidence to support. And, and when they have that, um, that drive for knowledge and they, they really want to uh, go forward, um, as faculty, we redirect them, we help them find uh, the information. Uh, we also help them find their voice uh, so they can really have that, uh, we encourage them so that they will find their way to be heard and, and to believe that they should be heard, uh, that they have, uh, so to build that confidence and to out, also uh, help them build the skills, the knowledge base, so that they can go forward. Sure. You know, one of the, the, the things that I've always thought about, I worked for two uh, political people in, in, um, when I lived in Maryland, and I, I was really close to um, a female who was running for, for governor. And I went around with her a lot. To, and, and the thing that I always wondered is, how do you manage a campaign? Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, how do you, when you make that decision, you, you know, you have to raise a lot of money. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's something that I think a lot of people yeah. might be afraid of. Mm -hmm. and, and so what was it that, that got you to the point that you could say, I'm going to do this. I am going to um, come, you know, face these challenges, get support, find the money, and mount a campaign. So I'll start. Uh, 
I'll start with you. Because <laughs> that's something that, that would probably cause some people to pause. Yes, yes. And to be honest with you, that doesn't change. Um, <laughs> uh, raising money is one of the hardest things that we do as elected officials. It's, because it's hard, right? It's hard to go to someone and say, can you bet on me? <coughs> can you take a chance on me? Can you, you know, write me a check and give me some money from your personal funds? It's, it's, it's difficult to, to do that. Um, and these races are not cheap. So it takes a lot of money to win. The higher up you're, you're running for, especially if there are other candidates in the race, um, it can get very, very expensive. But it's not the deciding factor. They're, they're, I don't think that I was ever, um, that I have ever outraised any of my opponents. Um, I believe in every single one of my elections, I was always outraised. My opponents raised more money than me, but they never outworked me. Mm -hmm. So work ethic, you, with, with a strong work ethic, you can <coughs> overcome uh, the, the lack of funds. Sure. That's good. That's a good message. So it's not always about who Are raises the, the, uh, the largest amount of money. So what is, what is your take on that, um, Representative Williams? Hard work pays off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in terms of just using myself as an example, I ran three times. I was defeated the first two times I ran by a 200 votes the first time for city council, and then the second time by 100 votes, and I kept knocking on the door. And we were, next time we were, we were elected. But, you know, when you're a, a person, of, especially a person of color and you're running, uh, and you get to the money piece, uh, we don't have that built-in mm -hmm. uh, institutional money piece. Mm -hmm. uh, our sure. friends don't have a lot of money. Our relatives don't have a lot of money. <laughs> our cousins don't have a lot of money. So we're always really scrapping. But to, to uh, Representative Orlando's point is that hard, you can't beat hard work. Mm -hmm. And you can't beat knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. And I would say to the students that uh, sometimes it's, it's, it is, it's discouraging the, the amount of money that you have to raise <laughs> in politics. You know, we really should put a ceiling on Every race, whether it's 20,000, 50, whatever that magic number is, put a ceiling on. Because some of these folks raise just outrageous, outrageous amount of money. So when people look at that, it, mm -hmm. it becomes very discouraging. Mm -hmm. You say, wow, I can't raise that kind of money. Sure. I can work, I can knock, but at some point in time, you're going to need some money to help you know, get your message out, your mm -hmm. messaging, your narrative, buy your signs, buy your TV, and buy your radio. But I would, I would, I would say one point. If, if, if you're interested in something, especially public service, you look at it and public service is for those who are interested in helping others. And that's why I wanted to do public service. Mm -hmm. It's because I wanted to be an advocate for those who were voiceless, who didn't have a voice. And uh, when you're an elected official in a gateway city, Holyoke Springs, for Chicago, we have, when you have a problem, it's, it's just not dealing with politics. The lights are shut off, my kid's in court, my water bill is on, t and we have to deal with that, plus with the other uh, 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 stuff that comes with the job. Mm -hmm. And that's very key, and I tell some of my colleagues sometime who you try to sit them down, we, we go back and forth, we, we talk to some of the folks who live out some of the suburbs, and I said, when you're in the belly of the beast, you're in the hood, you're in the gateway city. We, as a politician, and Betty will tell you, you deal with every aspect of every single problem. Uh -huh. That's real. Sure. So it's, it's very, it's, 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 it's tacking. And we have to deal with it. Because people are at your door, knocking on your door. Mm -hmm. I can't pay my rent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just real. We hear all of that. Sure. Orlando's just telling me today, I, I, how many fires do we put out? Every day, you're, you're just trying to help somebody. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but it's, 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 you sign up for the job, and sure. you, you, try to, you try to keep it. Yeah, but that launching of that first campaign, mm -hmm. I know as the first Puerto Rican <laughs> elected official, in Massachusetts, launching that campaign and getting people to back you, what was that like? Mm. Okay, ready? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I needed to raise money <laughs> until um, most of the people, the majority of the people that uh, were on my campaign um, were professors from different universities, um, teachers um, from Holyoke Public Schools, and of course, my neighbors. I lived on South Canal Street uh, down in South Holyoke. 
not your neighborhood. Um, and so, I'm on North Canal. <laughs> you're across the street. And so um, when people said, oh, we need to um, buy some uh, uh, bumper stickers, and we need this, and we need that, and it was like, so who's going to give us the money? And they were like, oh, we need to raise that money. Um, that, that never was my focus. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It was like, if we're going to do this, someone else has to raise the money. I need to knock on doors, and I need to get voters registered. Mm -hmm. um, and that was basically a year and a half of doing it. It was every single day, seven days a week. There was no rest, and I was working full time. Mm -hmm. um, and it just needed to happen. I just needed to hear what, uh, what people wanted to see. Um, what their dreams and aspirations were for their children and for the neighborhood kids. Mm -hmm. um, I used to drive a bunch of kids from South Canal Street up to Peck because there was no bus transportation in a Volkswagen. It looked like, you know, the, the circus clown <laughs> and kids were popping until the Volkswagen died and then we were all walking. Um, but it's, um, it was, it, the, at that time, the amount of money that you now have to yes, raise mm -hmm. for the most simplest uh, seat in whatever commission or whatever city council school committee, it was minute at that right. time. Mm -hmm. It was not, it was about really getting the name out and getting the voters. Um, I'm gonna go back, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take two minutes of this to go back to something. Voter registration is difficult because you're going to hear all the opposition mm -hmm. of why people are not going to vote. Yeah. Been there, done that. You people mm -hmm. only come around, you know, during election mm -hmm. time, and then when I call you, you don't answer my call, and da 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 da. Sure. For us, the difficult time was with the city mm -hmm. because when primary day came, right? Um, people were, who had registered to vote, who we, the, I shouldn't say we because as a candidate you can't um, do voter registration, but you have your other teams doing sure. it. As they, we knew that these people were registered mm -hmm. and the city registrar's office, election office, mm -hmm. had crossed them off. A lot of them, uh, when they arrived, they said, you're not on the list. There was no interpretation services. Uh -huh. Nothing was in Spanish. It was a complicated machine system that we had. So people were being taken, you know, or going back. They would find some of us who were scattered around the city. And um, we had to learn from that experience. Mm -hmm. And d between that and election day, what we did is, is we asked for the Rainbow Coalition. Jesse Jackson oh. headed it up, mm -hmm. all right? Everybody. We called in, we called in the troops. Yeah. We called in the troops, yeah. we had attorneys ready, and it wasn't to strong arm voters because they're gonna vote how they're gonna vote, but we wanted to let everyone know that there were outside folks that knew about, were serious about the election process, mm -hmm. and they were in the city. And that's how we were able to get past that. And in some communities, that's still going on. Sure. Let's not fool ourselves. Yeah. It's like, oh, I went to vote, but they told me I wasn't on the list, so I went home. Sure. All right. So for, as a candidate, very first priority is, is to make sure people are registered, make sure that they are on the list on the primary day and election day um, in order to be able to have a smoother um, process. But that was the struggle then. It's a different thing now. <laughs> now it's about money and it's about the hard work that yeah. knocking on every door. Just wanted to share that with yeah. you. Oh, I appreciate you sharing that. But you know, the thing that I would say for you is she was your role model. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. right. And so when you started thinking about this campaign. I have campaign, to say thank you for that too. <laughs> for real, I never really got to say actually thank you for paving the way. Um, we're mm. always like working in, in, in like in different circles and mm -hmm. then we say what's up with passing we talk and then we build and it's always about community and working on different projects working, working, working. Mm -hmm. um would for me it's uh there's betty there's uh gladys orlando gladys, Stella, right. uh, miguel uh Sam carlos vega. and then i have aaron vega yeah. um then the, i got boys and girls club staff from back in the mm -hmm. days when i was a kid um <clears throat> the reasons for me for running i grew up in the flats, lower mm. income neighborhood. Um, it, I've always, like I grew up in, in, a, in Tefford Apartments, there's probably a group of us, maybe about 10 kids that grew up in the same age group, that grew up in the same era. Um, we all kind of went to prison. I was what, one of two, two of us graduated high school and 
I'm the only one that graduated from college. Mm. So Uh-oh. like with, 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 this, with that alone, for me, is just thinking like, how can I inspire others? How can I lead, for example, especially in my community in the lower wards? Because it's true, people don't, people don't think you really represent them, right? Mm-hmm. Until I actually met Gladys, my ward one rep, and then <laughs> I'm actually having a conversation with her, and then she's like, okay, you wanna do that? Let's do this then, let's do that. Mm-hmm. And, and you start realizing like, wow, you can. And, and the ability for you to be able to do it um, is just there. So I asked one day, it was, I was talking to Josh, this was before we even, he even thought about running for mayor. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I ran, because I ran before and I had lost the first time, I lost by 200 too. There you go. And it was an at-large race. They told me not to run at large because they say Latinos don't win at large in Holyoke. Um, one of the main reasons I chose to run at large was because I said, I'm gonna win as an at large candidate <laughs> in Holyoke, right? Um, the other reasons is that most of the at large candidates in Holyoke live in two sections of Holyoke, in Ward 6 and 7, which are the, I don't, I don't wanna say the richest, but they're the most prominent sections of Holyoke. Um, so, how are um, these representatives representing all of Holyoke, right, when you all live in one neighborhood? Um, you try to represent it to a certain extent, but in our reality, when you walk outside, you see what you see in front of your homes, mm. you hear from your neighbors. So when I'm hearing as an at-large counselors, I hear from people, because I live in Ward 3, I hear from people in Ward 3, but I also hear from people in Ward 1 and 2, sure. because I grew up in Ward 1 and 2. So they're gonna like, reach out I, to I, you. I, I went across <laughs> the bridges, I, I have a pass, in Ward 1 and Ward 2, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I know I can connect bridges. That's one of the main reasons why I ran. For me, it was an inspiration to, to the community. I'm an ex-felon. A lot of the people in the community are like, you know what, you're running, I'm gonna vote, I'm gonna register. Mm-hmm. So that was the thing for me, right? It's, it's trying to get more people registered, trying to get more people to come out and vote, and then to show you that you don't have to be a cookie cutter person to be sitting in the seat there in council chambers. I am a different person. I am not like any of the people in the chambers, and they know that, and they totally understand that. And for me, it's taking up the space, and this is what I want to tell the students. It's like, no matter what you think or how you feel, you show up and you take up the space as much as you can to the best of your abilities. Um, whether, whether they like it or not, that's on them. Uh, like you try your best. For me, I tried my best the first time. I almost won. Right. Um, I ran on $3,000. <laughs> the second time I raised another three thousand mm-hmm. um, dollars, people are like, "Wow, it's crazy." Um, for me, uh, use your connections, right? Yeah. yeah. My connections were Holyoke Public Schools, Holyoke Boys and Girls Club, Boys Club. Holy mm-hmm. Little League Baseball, mm-hmm. basketball. Uh, my coaches are now um, they're they're at a point where they're the voters, right? A lot of the, my kids, when I worked at the Boys and Girls Club, now they're they're, they're late twenties, early thirties. They're voters now too. So. It's a larger connection to people. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a group chat for MOB 22, right? <laughs> for, for PlayStation, right? And we're playing amongst <laughs> PlayStation and Xbox, right? And then, um, yeah. as I enter, uh, um, one of the guys is like, "Yo, don't lose to the city councilor. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, don't lose to the city councilor, right?" Yeah. So it's like. It, for them, it's a different concept. It's a different experience for the people that I'm around and the circles that I'm always in. I, I, I try to keep it 100, as I say, wherever I go. Sometimes it doesn't work out the, the best, but yeah. like I said, I try my best and I put my best foot forward, and that's what I would ask for anybody else to do. You know, that the, 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 you know all of your networks, mm-hmm. I hear you, you talking about, and, and organizing those networks uh, to support you and I guess one of the things, all of you had lives before you decided to run for uh, public office. You were doing something where you were making money, doing mm. okay, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> you were not, not much. <laughs> not <laughs> not <laughs> much. Okay. Paycheck to paycheck. Paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> That's right. so, so when you make that, that choice uh, to, to step out of a comfort zone, you know, what, you know, what is it like to be able to say, okay, I'm going to do this now, um, and I'm going to organize. How do you how do you make that decision? And I, I guess the the reasons why I'm I'm asking that we have a lot of communication and political science students mm-hmm. here on campus, and we have students who may because of their inspirations from seeing you here this afternoon um, make that choice too. So share a little bit. It, with me about well, your, how do we get them to think like that? First of all, I think Josh hit it, hit, 
hit the ball out of the park in terms of the network. I was grew up at the boys club in Springfield, I'm a boys club guy. Congressman Neal's a boys club guy, Henry mm. Payne's a guy, a lot of us. And those friendships you have, it's, 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 it's forever. But uh, I was a probation officer, mm -hmm. a Springfield District Court, mm -hmm. busiest court in the Commonwealth, for many years retired from the trial court. But I was also an athlete and I played sports and I coached. I coached basketball, I coached, in those days you coached everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Soccer, right. basketball, <laughs> football. football, softball. And then uh, you see leadership, you see people like Betty and, and the Ben Swans and the Ray Jordans of the world going out, uh, putting it all on the line, mm -hmm. basically, to betterment the community. Uh, not perfect, but to betterment our communities. It's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It's a heck of a sacrifice. And uh, my wife, uh, Dr. Gloria Williams, a trustee here, uh, had a talk over with her in terms of uh, what my ambitions were, what I wanted to do, because at the end of the day, it's a tremendous sacrifice on the family. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a sacrifice on the family, and so, so we did it and we made it, and I want to just uh, always commend her for being uh, in front of me and not, and not behind me. And certainly, uh, those, those friendships uh, uh, that you make and the things you do, um, sometimes it's a thankless job, mm -hmm. because for every time you do something right, there's 99 people in line <laughs> that you can't <laughs> really. That's it, like it, being it, the president. It, yeah, it is. <laughs> you have to say no so many times. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, but at the end of the day, I think uh, it just, I want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, I was one of 10 children, grew up on the north end of Springfield, which mm -hmm. is very poor. Uh, we were uh, black, brown, Russians, Jews. It was, it was a real melting pot, as uh, Betty said, the Rainbow Coalition, basically. And uh, I was given a second chance, as Josh and Orlando were, by someone at the Boys Club who believed in me, mm -hmm. who believed in us because I uh, had a father who, uh, I lost my father very, I was 17, my father died. Mm -hmm. So I had a, a role model named Art Jones from the Boys Club who became my surrogate surrogate father along with Big Will. And there were so many mentors, and I think Josh and Landon would say this and Betty, there were so many people in our community that helped so many people. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you just gave back. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of, that, that, and I'm not trying to cast any aspersions on, on the, any generation. I just don't see the, the, the give back to the community. Mm -hmm. Like when I, I had so many role models there. And sure. People now, every time they do something, they want to get paid. They, they mm -hmm. want to get paid. We had coaches and referees. They would do it for the betterment of those little kids. Because we know in order to really change society around, it's not when they get in the adult. It's down in the preschool, in the kindergarten. It's where you got to get to them. Sure. You just have to get to them. And once they get here, it's, it's kind of out of whack. So I just think, I'm just so grateful I had so many people that supported me and just did, believed in me and invested in me. Uh, you know, I was a, a little black boy coming up in Springfield. Uh, didn't know anything about politics, didn't know anything about the court, didn't know anything about lawyers. We just, all we just wanted to play baseball and, you know, shine shoes and pick up cans and stuff. And then one day, uh, Someone, I mean, we used to go at the Boys Club, and the Boys Club is just one of those institutions mm -hmm. that really, they've saved a lot of kids. That's Denzel Washington, mm -hmm. Shaq O'Neal. Mm -hmm. They have saved a lot of people, and someone used to believe in us and said, you know, you are somebody, and you can, you can be something, no matter where you are. It's not, uh, it's not where you are, it's where you're going that counts. Sure. That's it, so I'll, I know I've gone on. No, I, you know, those, you, you, do you want to pick up on, on, on what Representative Williams just said? I, 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 I can say a role model and someone touching you when oh, you're young and saying you, you can do it is really a, a good inspiration. Can't beat it. So how does that translate into wanting to run for public office? So what are your, how do you think uh, about that? I never had any idea um, that I wanted to run that I would ever run for public office one day. Um, you know, had someone told me, you know, one day, someone would have told me 15 years ago, you're going to be a state rep. I, I would, would have said, what's, what's a state rep? What's a state rep? <laughs> I don't know what that for is. Real. Um, for real. I was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. I was swinging a hammer. I was 
building houses, bridges, schools, and I was happy. I was making a great living, uh, great benefits. I was a unique carpenter, so I was making great wages and, and benefits, and, and I thought I was going to retire a carpenter. Uh -huh. I thought that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Sure. And I would have been happy, but God had other plans uh, for me. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually ended up getting hurt on the job, and I decided to go back to school. Mm -hmm. While I was in school, I got offered an internship at the governor's office okay. under Deval Patrick. And that's where I fell in love with public service. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is what I want to do. Sure. So, physically, I may not be able to be a carpenter anymore. I'm not sure <laughs> I want to do that for the rest of my life. Um, mm. But this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it's interesting because as a city councilor, it is a part-time position. It's a full-time job mm -hmm. with part-time pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have to have another job in order to sustain a family. And I was a single dad, so of course I was working full-time um, at the time. When I decided to run for state rep, I was on the city council and I was also a union organizer. Okay. And I actually took a 30, oh, over $30,000 a year pay cut to run for state rep because this is what I wanted to do. Sure. This is the job that I love. I love to be in a position to be able to help people in my mm -hmm. community. Uh, and so my advice is don't do it for the money, yes. right? Um, but if this is a passion and if you love helping people, this is very, very sure. rewarding position. Helping people. So Professor, listening to, to this conversation, <laughs> it's really, uh, how do we, what should we be doing on campus to, um, to encourage public service, to, en to encourage people to get in, engaged in, in society? How do we, how do we uh, develop curriculum to, uh, to do, to create people like this? <laughs> Uh, the first thing is uh, engaging with our alumni. Mm -hmm. We have such great role models here. And mm -hmm. to, uh, when the students see you, see what you're doing, that really encourages them, wow, I can do that too. Uh, the internships. Uh, yeah. I've had so many students who have been interning within government and they've been done so well, they make the connections. And then they, they get those jobs after. They, uh, they, uh, they impress people. And then where they're interning, uh, those offices are calling me. We want more interns mm -hmm. from Westfield State. So that's awesome. And uh, the interns we have are for the undergrad. We're working on it, uh, developing for the graduate as well. Um, for building the curriculum, uh, first thing is a lot of students at first don't really think about public service. Um, but to get to know who they are, what interests them. Uh, so I have those conversations. I get to know who the students are. And uh, when I find what interests them, while well, government is so involved in so many different things, we start the conversation about, well, how is government involved in what you want to do with your career? And then how can you be an advocate for a change for yourself? Um, and then we discuss the process on then how you would go about doing that. Um, for our grad students, they're coming in, they, they want to change the world. Um, <laughs> and they want, to, they want to be those leaders. So whether they're coming from undergrad or their mid-career coming back, um, they have the plan, they know what they want to do, and we're, um, then working to develop those skills so that they can really go forward um, and uh, with with our different concentrations they can really focus on exactly what they want to be doing in public service you know you Israel you said something that really intrigued me you said you were a felon I am yeah, yeah. I and am. so one of the the you know you always think of or there's a, a, a stigma associated yeah. with certain, you know, with certain identities. Right. Either, you know, and I think about gay or, you know, someone who's, who is a felon. How do you overcome that and develop the competence to, to move on and don't let that define you? But I was, I'm just saying I was very intrigued when no, I heard cool. those words. So, so for me, what helps me develop the confidence and to continue striving forward on the path is the fact that I think it's probably, it's, it's God, right? I feel like my, it, I, 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 as a kid, was able to learn things and pick things up easily, right? in classrooms and in school, I never did my homework. Because I thought, I thought home was for home and school was for school. Now in school, you don't get homework in Holyoke. But I would have straight A's now. But um, ultimately, um, where it comes down to it, I feel like my path has been chosen for me to do what I'm doing 
for a lot of other people that come behind me or are on the same status as me with regards to ex-felon status, right? Because uh, we are not a protected population, right? <laughs> Even though, in a sense, we are attacked in so many different ways, right? Um, and, and I don't want to say as, it, as we deserve it because there are some mistakes that people make. People go through processes and, and there's a stigma attached to it. But, but ultimately, um, I graduated from HTC in 2016. Uh, I, I transferred to UMass in the Mass Transfer Compact, but um, which kind of guarantees automatic access mm -hmm. into any state university. Mm -hmm. But there's an asterisk if you have a criminal record, it's mm -hmm. up to the university mm -hmm. to accept okay. you. So they kind of denied me at first, and I had to go to speak to the. I asked, I, this is what helped me with the politics part. I asked Alex Morse to write a letter for me. Okay. And he did. Aaron Vega wrote a letter for me. Mm -hmm. um, he was my state rep. So then uh, I started learning how to work my connections sure. in the city so that I can, uh, uh, I can kind of flex a muscle, right, in a sense. And they were working on a project with Wisteria Hearst on mass incarceration, which they had mm -hmm. invited me to work on, okay. right? So I kind of was like, how can I work on your project, but you won't accept me at the time? Mm -hmm. So then when it all spun around, they met with me. They then said, we will accept you into the school, all the other stuff, which is cool. I ended up graduating a year later, year and a half later, from UMass with like a 3.8. <laughs> I graduated high school with 1.6. So, like, <laughs> so for me, it's like I tell the kids in the community, high school is not your end story. Understand that. Sure. HCC and STCC are great avenues to get you to where you need to go mm -hmm. whenever you decide to, to start taking that path, right? Because sure. not everybody's path is the same. Everybody takes their turns on different levels. Mm -hmm. Some people age differently with regards to maturity. Sure. So, so, so for me, it's trying to lead by example. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for a, a program similar to ROCA. I'm sure you guys have heard of ROCA. At the mm -hmm. time, it was the Holyoke Safe and Successful Youth Initiative. Mm -hmm. It was a, a grant program that was designed by Governor Deval Patrick. Um, a shan is some of the Shannon grant money. Mm -hmm. um, that provided me the first opportunity to work um, I, when I first came out of prison, $15 an hour mm -hmm. as an outreach worker working with kids that were coming out of prison. Sure. And I'm leading, um, leading as a role model when I'm doing this and going to school at the same time and building connections within the community, trying to make, knock down barriers. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like there's a larger community behind me mm -hmm. that needs to see it, needs to hear it, and needs to, to experience it. it. Because when I came out, they told me I needed to go get like my serve safe uh -huh. <laughs> and like, uh, you know, the little, the little certificates mm -hmm. or whatnot mm -hmm. that I wouldn't be able to work in schools. Mm -hmm. I just quit a job that, that I was the head family engagement coordinator sure, of the district. Right. So it's like there, there, there are opportunities there for you. You just got to go get them and don't right. matter what they say. Um, so for me, it's trying to become a pillar mm -hmm. so that I can help so use my social equity, right, that I'm gaining sure. and I'm building mm -hmm. for everyone. And we're happy to have you on our MPA program. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I am just so uh, I am just so inspired by hearing Thank that. You. Okay. Uh, and let me just say, you said you had less than a 2.0 average. Yeah, right? I did in high school. And <laughs> so I actually stood back freshman year. I was a freshman, freshman, sophomore, mm -hmm. senior. Mm -hmm. I skipped junior year. But that, <laughs> just uh, on the heels of that, mm -hmm. Israel. Yeah. I, I was calling Josh. No, I, we're. I gave, <laughs> Josh is the mayor. So I know he's the yeah. mayor. Josh, yeah. Josh, he's one of my, my best men <laughs> at okay, my wedding. Good. So I'm sorry. Yeah. He's All right, Israel. Yeah. But, but when uh, in 2018, uh, the House and the Senate, and one with uh, Governor Baker, we did uh, criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. That was 2018. 2020, we did the uh, police reform. And these are the kind of stories that we wanted to come out of that reform yeah. because uh, mass incarceration has really devastated mm -hmm. black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's taken a lot of our good young men mm -hmm. and threw them in jail right. for, uh, you know, this much drugs, that much drugs, whereas somebody in a mm -hmm. suburb get mm -hmm. an ounce and they mm -hmm. get uh, probation or something. Yeah. But, but that, that's a that success story. But, oh. but, <laughs> what, but what has to happen, that's, that's a perfect example of, of going into the community mm -hmm. and folks seeing it in real time right. that you are able to overcome many barriers, mm -hmm. many hurdles, because mm -hmm. it, it ain't easy. And sure. I know it ain't easy. But just to commend you, Israel, but that's, that's a good story. And right. folks, young people need to see that story. Right. Mm -hmm. To see it and feel it. 
because uh, back when I was coming up, we always, our folks are really visual, I'm a visual person, mm -hmm. visual learner. So I have to see it, but for them to see that success story, it, it goes along, it speaks volumes. Sure. And you will inspire a lot of young people mm -hmm. who have gone off the track, but second chance and redemption is right. very important. Redemption. That's my piece. That's yeah. Yeah. I, I just, you know, the, the, the reason why I wanted to pick up on it and then for you to talk about your GPA. <laughs> and you. and for an uh, academic institution, you know, uh, I always say people mature at about at a different age. Yeah. And, and so how do we look at policies that we have on at universities to, to allow people uh, a second chance, like you had. So, so we, uh, I need to probably have you come and talk to some That's of it. our, That's our right. faculty. But the, the thing that I, I, I just wanted to get the rest of you uh, to talk about is how has your presence in, poli in politics and a communi community leader influenced others? You, you know, I've already, uh, and I, I you know, you've already inspired me, so let me just <laughs> say you. that. But, uh, you know, how has uh, your presence inspired, inspired people? And people have talked a little bit about that already this afternoon. You know, we all come into it for the right reason. Mm -hmm. And I say this across the entire nation. I think we all go into it for the right reason. I think some people get sidetracked. Um, you moved me, <laughs> you moved mm, me, mm. when you were challenged yeah. um, because you were a school department employee and you had broken the barrier. You were able to, be, to get the voters to believe in you and um, despite your little uh, fundraising effort there, um, <laughs> it didn't kind of make the mark, but <laughs> that you had people believe in you to go out and vote for you. And for you to then say, I am willing to give up mm. my employment. Mm. Keep it, yeah. That, I'm sorry, you know, as, as someone who raised um, a lot of men, a lot of boys, um, you need to have that bread and butter on the table. Yeah, I got it for my wife's family. <laughs> and, you have, <laughs> and you have an amazing wife. Yes. You were expecting a second child. Yes. And you said, my commitment is to my people, to the community. And that, for me, just kind of like took everything off the table. It was like, this is real. This sure. is really real. Again. Yeah. And the piece it. there will be is, is that even though you gave that up that night, you were still challenged, mm -hmm. and you were disrespected, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And you still held up your end. So for that, I say, as a mother of men of color, I thank you very, very <laughs> much for making me so proud, even though I watched that TV and my blood pressure was like, I think I need another yeah. pill. Because um, that was agonizing to watch. Sure. Um, but I think that it will be, you know, for me, it's been a very long time. Mm -hmm. I left um, that political arena in the 90s. Um, but I, it's always been about being also an organizer, right? Because that's, that's, that's embedded mm -hmm. in us, right? That's in yeah. there. Sure. If you can't organize, you can't make it through an election. And so it's also keeping your, your finger on the pulse of the community. Uh -huh. if, you, if you in any way walk away from that, negotiate that, or don't pay attention, then you need to go. Sure. Then you right. need to go. Right. Sure. I, I want to give each one of you a chance because I, you, you know, uh, Representative Williams, you talked about uh, how you had to talk to your wife and get her in front of you on this. <laughs> Not behind you or beside you, but in front. I, I, I just found that an inspiring comment, too, about how you were able to get involved in politics. Well, you know, it's, um, it's a tremendous sacrifice if you do it the right way. Mm -hmm. And um, long days long nights, long meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, now we commute to Boston. And you have to have I, your family in lockstep mm -hmm. and believing in what you believe in mm -hmm. and your mission to help someone. Because my wife would always say, the phone never stops ringing. It never <laughs> stops ringing. It never stops ringing. Mm -hmm. Well, when you sign up for the job, you do the job. Sure. And I just try to do the job to the best of, uh, of my ability. In terms of getting help from... Uh, 
different organizations mm -hmm. and the church. Church has been a big part of my life. As you said, God has, God always has mm -hmm. a plan for us. And um, the fraternities mm -hmm. and the sororities have always backed me. And I used to tell people, you have to have a posse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, the Lone Ranger didn't have a posse, but most folks have a posse. You have to have folks, you have a posse. That means your, your little, your universe, uh, the world you orbit in, that, that people really support you because there's so much negativity outside of that. Mm -hmm. And in this business, someone's always shooting at you. Sure. Just, it's, just the na it's just the nature of the business. So I don't, my wife sometimes gets kind of upset because someone will say something. I say, well, you're a public official. Sure. You're, you're public. There's no defamation of character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there just isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're held to a, to a higher standard. So I have to really thank her and my family and you know the kids for and my family for really supporting and, sure. and being there and understanding that uh, sometimes you know I'm gone. Sure. And it's hard. It's very taxing on families. If someone you know, uh, for an example, uh, Governor Baker, uh, he was due for a third term, but he had talked over with his family and they said, we don't want you know, basically we're out. Sure. We don't. So he said, okay. And I remember I, when he said he wanted, I text them, and he says, "Well, I says, you know what, family first. I text them back, family first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Representative Orlando. Well, I think it's uh, very important to have the, the support of your family. So, when the first time that I ran for for office, uh, my support system was uh, was a seven year old, yeah. uh, <laughs> my daughter." Um, and she's 18 now. She's all she's she's all grown up. She she knows it all. Right? And of course, she's 18. So. At 18, you know a lot. Yes. yes. Um, but the first time I, I lost my first two times, just like these gentlemen. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't win my first time. I, I lost the first time by 80 votes. Ran again two years later. I lost by 40 votes. Oh my god. And then I ran again a third time. I ran smarter. Oh. I ran harder. Oh. And I won by 430 votes. It was a two to one margin. Sure. And um, but the reason why I ran, I almost give up. I said, you know, I lost twice. Who's gonna vote for me the third time? Um, and I actually decided. I said, I'm not gonna run. And it was my daughter who uh, who told me she guilted me into running a third time. Oh, did she? <laughs> she said, Papi, you're always telling me not to give up. Oh. And how are you gonna give up? Mm -hmm. And that was why I decided to run a third sure. time. Sure, that's a great story. That's a good one right there. Can I just? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean. Comment about there's I want to comment about uh, Representative Ramos mm -hmm. for just a short just a short time, and I've watched him grow. I've served okay. with him on the council in 2013, and, <laughs> and uh, he, uh, you know, single dad, uh -huh. and he's been there. Mm -hmm. I mean, some men get mm -hmm. a bad rap mm -hmm. for not sticking, but he stuck and raised it. I've watched her grow right up before my <laughs> eyes. I just want to. I just think that. Publicly, mm -hmm. someone should know that he stayed. He hung in there, and he raised that baby. Mm -hmm. She's a fine young lady now. So men, I hope as she's I said, here at Westfield. <laughs> <laughs> but men sometimes get a bad rap, yeah. and, and 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 sometimes rightfully so. Sure. We walk away, but he he's been there, and he's uh, I've seen him. I've seen him cry sometimes. I've seen him do stuff. So sure. just want to commend you, my brother. Thank you. Yeah. That, that, that's I just special. want to get that, that in there. That, that that's very special. For, yeah. That is very special, and yeah. thank you for adding that. I think the lesson. The lesson that we've learned uh, before I get to the audience question is how do we at the university uh, transform our, our policies for admissions <laughs> in order to, um, to support people, people like this because we, you know, we have, uh, we have criteria that we, we say is steadfast and I know I've said to people you know, especially boys, I said they 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 don't always do well in high school. So how do we transform right. our our policies to give people a chance? We want to make sure that the policies that we have are uh, are appropriate. So an example with the MPA program when I came aboard, we would require a GRE for mm -hmm. uh, for admissions, mm -hmm. and I wanted to look to see well, does that really make sense? Uh, so I looked at all the records of graduates uh, of students in the program 
uh, to see GRE scores. Does that have any effect on your success at the program, and I found no statistical significance. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and there are there are well known concerns with standardized tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so by having it as an optional, so if you think it'll help your application, great. Um, but to make it not a requirement to be an obstacle. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of those things. And to look at the overall person, mm -hmm. uh, to see what they've done, where they're at, and to have that all. Uh, part of the admissions process. So we've had really good students who um, maybe on paper, mm -hmm. um, they don't have like the 4.0 or, um, but they have that life experience and uh, they've been trainers and wherever they work mm -hmm. and that certain experiences there where I can see that and I can see uh, this is a person that I want to invest in. This is someone I think will do well uh, and I think will succeed and will go on to be that great leader we want them to be. Sure. It's funny because I, that, that's one of the reasons why I chose the MPA program was because of, there was no GRE requirement. Oh, okay. That's it. That's I don't, I don't <laughs> know what GRE yeah. is. So that's so a lesson. I don't, I, don't, I don't test well. <laughs> uh -huh. um, like, I, I can write you a paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could write. I'd rather write a 20-page paper than to do a 10-question test. Okay. And But that was one of the things that attracted me to the program. Sure. And I, and I think the, 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 the cultural competency that needs to exist uh, we know the, the, the uh, higher ed uh, universities, the scales are unbalanced. Mm -hmm. There are not enough black and brown people attending these universities, and we know why. Now, a lot of the universities that are more, and you've done a fantastic job, but well, some are more engaged, and it's, it's almost how much money can we raise, which you have to, yeah. and uh, how can we get students from all over the world all to come world. and pay that mm -hmm. high tuition. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, you have a whole wealth of talent. And we have to figure a way, universities have to figure a way, because people say, well, I go to the university, I pay all this money, and when I, <laughs> when I come out, I pay all of this money, mm -hmm. I could just went to high school and got out and found a job somewhere. That's right, sure. So that cultural piece, and how do we make uh, the, the universities and the colleges reflect the mainstream of society in, mm -hmm. in our, in our uh, professors, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in our students. So mm -hmm. when someone comes to campus, they look and say, wow, mm -hmm. I, I, I can, I see me you can in see yourself. Yeah. Yeah. other right. than that. Mm -hmm. But that was I the think. the struggle I had at UMass mm -hmm. when I was an undergrad at UMass. So it's like, you think and you look, like you, Springfield, Chickabee, and Holyoke on itself has a huge population right. of black and brown. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you go to UMass and it's like, Mm -hmm. Where are the black and brown people yep. at? Like, mm -hmm. like, what's going on here? Like, mm -hmm. and then the age, with the mass transfer compact, I'm like, all you had to have is like a 2.8 or a 3.0 yeah. to get to that mm -hmm. level wherever it's at. So, I mean, I haven't gone here in person yet because all my <laughs> classes are online, and this is my first semester. Um, but so far, my classes, I, I, they've been diverse by name, I would say because <laughs> I haven't seen faces okay but the experiences have been well everything is good I, I I can't complain it's 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 been an awesome experience so far um for me though like I I agree with you 110 percent like we sh how do you get as as a kid with the Boys and Girls Club right I've been to field trips to Westfield State mm -hmm. to UMass mm -hmm. to uh Smith College uh, uh Mount Holyoke Amherst and you think like would I ever be able to come no. to school here, right? Uh -huh. So when I actually went to UMass and I was by the library, I sat there and I was like, I can't believe I stood here as a kid, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You think about it, like, but like, right, yeah. it shouldn't be that though. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be that. Like UMass is 30 minutes away. Westfield is 15, 20 minutes away from Holyoke. Mm -hmm. Like these places are not that far from us. Why is it something that is so surreal for somebody that's that close? Sure. You know what I mean? Like if we could bridge that gap. Bridge that around. gap yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I just, love hearing these comments and and our faculty will be uh, exposed to them uh, as well. I just thought the audience has asked a question that I'd love mm. for each one of you to respond to. And they say, in this time of great division, what gives you hope? I'll answer that. Okay. Right here. <laughs> okay. They were not here. 
back uh -huh. in the 80s and the 90s. Mm. Okay. And when you look across, um, whether it be in Springfield or right now in Chicopee, we Chicopee, have right. the first the attorney, a uh, woman yeah. of color on city council. Um, Holyoke elected its first Latino um, mayor, and you keep on, there's, you know, across the, across the entire state, you know, Lemonster yeah. and Lowell mm -hmm. and others mm -hmm. have been able to do that. Um, that's what gives me hope, mm -hmm. that there is, that it's not going necessarily backwards, where people are saying too much of a sacrifice, too much of a hassle, too much peeling back the onion, mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna go for it, and we're gonna stay there and encourage others, and that's, that's my hope, that's what I walk away with. Mm -hmm. I think for me, what gives me hope is the community in Holyoke itself, right? Uh, I try to stay. So uh, one of the other reasons why, to me, Westfield is awesome is because we focus more on local politics mm -hmm. and the state mm -hmm. and more closer, right? So for me, it's like local is more important than anything else. Local politics is the most important thing. Then you go to state, then you go to federal. Mm -hmm. Federal is awesome. The pres Voting for the president is cool. but. The person that really affects your every day is your mayor and your council. Uh -huh. <laughs> so sure. so those are the people that you should be really counting on on a regular basis. I know people that don't vote for the mayor and council, but go vote for the president. Right. And to me, it's like, uh. So like the hope comes from the city of Holyoke, right? Where mm -hmm. we all come together on different events, different occasions. We share each other's diversity. There are issues that obviously are, that we have in the community, but it's the same everywhere you go. There's issues any in any community. But for us, it's we try to say that we bleed purple, right? Um, and you say that no matter what nationality you are, what background, some people even say that and they didn't go to Holy High, they went to Dean Tech, which is black and yellow, not purple. <laughs> so it's, it's so like overall, it, it, like that community feeling for me is what gives me hope to continue to, to work for my people in Holyoke, what I'm doing uh, for my organization that I work for, which is Families First. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm working collaborations with other people in the community like Betty and um, what I'm just going to say, who else? Josh and uh, a variety of other community people. For me, that is what drives it, like working together. Mm -hmm. That's it. That gives you hope. Yeah. Representative Williams. Well, uh, can't, much cannot be added to that. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's really uh, working uh, together collectively and America's at a a crossroads mm -hmm. uh, at this point. At the great bipartisan support today, 5347 to first black uh, Supreme Court justice, female. But I go back to the George Floyd moment mm -hmm. in eight minutes and 30 seconds, whatever it was. And it was such egregious. And America saw something that they really hadn't seen since going back to in Birmingham, Alabama, when they had the hoses and the dogs. Mm -hmm. Those are visuals that America saw, the Rodney King situation. Mm -hmm. And it was so egregious and so bad, folks had thought we had arrived at a certain point in time, and we really hadn't. So that, out of that moment, we're still on the energy and we're evolving, but I've seen so many uh, different groups, Betty, that have become involved in a long metal of very high influence community doing a Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And talking, and Amherst talking about uh, that diversity and inclusion. That's, that gives me hope because when we did the movement, 60s, 70s, 80s, Dr. King and Jesse and the rest of them and the Bob Rivera's of the world, it was all of us doing it. When you walked on that, it was black and white and brown holding hands together. That was, that was the visual. That's mm -hmm. the unity that you have to show to America. Mm -hmm. You just can't be all black, all brown, mm -hmm. and white. Okay, we gotta be all in this together. And we did it in the Civil Rights Movement. We did it. We, we're at a crossroads now. I really believe we're heading in the right direction. Uh, as Dr. King always says, uh, evil can never trump good. It can never, good's always going to win out. Mm -hmm. Just we have to have the, the tenacity and the patience and we're out to stick with it. But as you said, it's all of us in this together. Mm -hmm. We're all, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. Mm -hmm. And this, 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 this color notions, which was artificially mm -hmm. concocted so folks could feel superior to other people, there's no color, there's such thing as color. They made this. So that's, that gives me hope that across the country, different towns and folks are, finally realize and recognize that black, brown, Asians, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And we all should be uh, just holding hands. Now we're not all gonna agree on everything, 
but we should be able to sit mm -hmm. down at the table of brotherhood and talk to one another. Mm -hmm. Talk, not at, talk to one another. Mm -hmm. And Du Bois said the, 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 the main thing in what was it, 21st century was the color line. Mm -hmm. Being able to talk about color and race, that's important. Mm -hmm. And I was going to go the same route. I mm -hmm. think uh, you know that George Floyd uh, murder mm -hmm. um, really changed the way that people look at race relations in our country. As um, horrible as it was, one of the worst moments for racial um, uh, um, conflict in our in our country. Um, of that, from that came an opportunity mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. to reinvent ourselves as as a government to. Um, reinvent the way that we govern in our communities. Um, I gave my inaugural speech on the floor uh -huh. of the uh, Massachusetts General Court on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. I wrote my capstone on <laughs> DEI. Wow. Um, okay. And these days, you can't go anywhere without mm -hmm. hearing a conversation about yeah. diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's because people realize from that moment that, you know what? Maybe there is something wrong with the way that we treat people mm -hmm. of color in our country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is such a thing as systematic racism, institutional racism, mm -hmm. and maybe we do need to change mm -hmm. the way that we govern. So sure. I think that gives me a little bit of hope. Mm -hmm. So what gives Good you job. hope? My students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so really, uh, in class, we have these uh, great discussions, and I have students who have really different, uh, truly held beliefs, but they listen to each other, they engage. Uh, they, uh, we have these conversations. and. Uh, Undergrads, it might take them a little bit to get them comfortable uh, to be part of it, but just uh, to have them come together, have them learn from each other. Um, and then for the graduate students, you talked about your capstone. Uh, we have uh, capstone students, right? Uh, grad students working on their capstones right now. They're tac tackling really difficult need uh, issues they need to. Um, so one student I've been working with who has been looking at um, the uh, bail process and mm -hmm. how that could be more equitable. Uh, somebody else looking at, mm -hmm. um, well, if you're able to have your record expunged, how come people don't know about it? Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do to, um, to let people know about that and help them get through the process so they can have that done? Mm -hmm. uh, so those real issues that I see the students, they care about, they're tackling, and once they graduate, they're gonna go on and they're gonna be uh, really working hard to enact that change, like, mm -hmm. like you're doing. Sure. So we have another question from the audience. How does, this, how does someone get their voice heard, and what can be done to help the average voter to better understand the system? Oh. Who wants to take that on? <laughs> I mean, I can start, I guess. Uh -huh. So for me, the way, the way a lot of my constituents get their voice heard is on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook? <laughs> With me, right, they reach out, <laughs> they start uh, inboxing or, or like, because a lot of them don't use the email system. Uh -huh. They don't, they, I mean, I haven't put my, my, my number up because I don't got a Google number yet, <laughs> right? Because it's not, I mean, my number's already out there and I already get blown up like crazy. <laughs> but it would be even worse. My wife would, she's already texting me. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so uh, I commend what you said earlier about your wife. She told it, I, everything I do, I have to ask permission for. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You're a smart guy. Yeah. She, so she, when, I, when I married her, she told me she always thought she was going to marry a pastor. Right. I told her I'm a, I'm a politician. It's, it's like, like, my phone rings almost as much. Right? I just do different things. Right? So um, ultimately, for, for me, though, like um, just making connections, right? It goes back to the networks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm in the community, and I make sure that while I'm in the community, I'm listening, because mm -hmm. people are making their voices heard even if they don't know it, right? Mm -hmm. They're making comics. They're saying, they're, they're saying indirects, right? They'll say something to someone else that I'm listening to, like in passing, because I'm at the bodega or whatnot. They're like, oh, the street down the road is destroyed. Like, what the hell? The city doesn't do anything or whatnot. And I'm just here listening. They don't even know I'm a city councilor. So I'm like, oh, okay. I take that with me. And where I go, I'm filing an order for that street or whatnot. So like, for me, it, 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 I, I see them doing it and, and going out to, to, to council chambers if they can. But not a lot. It's, it's actually intimidating. Yeah. It's actually yeah, intimidating yeah. for a lot of people. Sure. So, it's educating, right, mm -hmm. um, the public on how the system works, um, how to be heard. Um, so if somehow, some way, municipalities, and then I think this is something that I want to talk to the mayor and some of the other city councilors 
is to try to put some funding or get some funding so that we can create some some civ some more civic engagement programming because there used to be some because I used to take some right <laughs> I used to take them I think uh, Betty was in charge of some of that too mm -hmm. <laughs> so like ultimately is bringing some of that back right mm -hmm. and then giving it to the kids I presented to a tenth grade the other day at Holyoke High and one of the kids asked me what is a city councilor. <laughs> yeah. And they were in the civics pro, like it's not civics, but like it's something similar to civics, that, that the group that they're in. And I was like, that's a good question. I, I, I am going to explain what I know the answer to is to that. So um, for them, they got a lot out of it. Um, they got to hear that I wasn't the cookie cutter kid, right? The cookie cutter model. So for them, it was a real experience and a real situation. Um, honestly, me running from Ward 1, not running from Ward 1, but running for, coming from Ward 1, now you see a lot of different people that are serving on commissions on, on, on a bunch of, there's Parks and Recs, there's also CPA, there's also, uh, I think, mm -hmm. uh, the licensing board. A lot of them will have Ward 1 reps now mm -hmm. that are coming from the lower wards. So it's like, Betty, you started something a long time ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's catching on like wildfire, <laughs> like, yeah. little by little, right? Mm -hmm. It's taking a long time, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, for me, it's, uh, it's more education, and, and sure. the municipality is actually trying to take the time to invest in that education mm -hmm. um, for their community. Sure. Thank you for raising that. This used to happen in Holyoke, used to happen in the North End, yep. Barbara Rivera, may God rest her soul. Um, it was about civic engagement yep. 101. Mm -hmm. The schools also had similar programs. I remember Law in America in Holyoke up at the high school. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to know who the judicial system is, who is the one that's making laws, um, how is it that a bill gets filed, sure. and yeah. how is it, what's the process? Because, I mean, you guys got like a billion bills yeah. that it, I would say not even a third of them get, you know, um, even heard because it's so much. Mm. But at the same time, if you know who to go to, if I know that I have a city councilor, I'm going to talk to you. You might be representing me. We have some conversations to have. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you know who is it that's representing you, mm -hmm. that you can either you know um, make sure that if they have community meetings, which most people do, or that there is a way to contact. This morning, something happened in Holyoke, um, and I got up right and did my thing, and I turn on the phone just to see, and there's a Facebook um, announcement there from our mayor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that I saw, mm -hmm. and he did it. He put it together in Spanish, mm -hmm. and he put because it was directed to the Latino yeah. community, uh -huh. and he did it in English. It was like, whoa, oh. we are moving mm -hmm. the needle sure. forward. Yeah. It's sure. about communicating mm -hmm. when there is going to be a change uh, or things that people are used to, mm -hmm. and, and the mayor is initiating this, mm -hmm. and he puts it out. Now, all of a sudden, there mm -hmm. were like pages and pages and pages of <laughs> all different kind of comments and going yeah. on. But it really is changing the narrative of how to communicate. Sure. Right. I think that Facebook has, I think that technology, uh -huh. social media has changed all of that. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I think also that it gives people the opportunity to have their voice heard sure. um, in a way that, one, you could agree or disagree, right? right. Um, you could, you know, kind of get a lot of backlash from it, mm -hmm. but you got to also know how to put your stuff out there. But I think that there's, it's changing times, and I think that social media is doing that. This didn't happen 30 years ago, mm -hmm. 40 years ago, maybe not even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this um, social media has a lot to play with it, mm -hmm. but it also is about those that are in power and in seat to take advantage of those opportunities. Sure. We didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. <laughs> we didn't have nothing. <laughs> I think the main thing is, is the civic engagement, mm -hmm. which uh, we're working in the House of Representatives now to put put a package together for civic engagement mm -hmm. for our students because we've really fallen off sure. off, the, mm -hmm. off the cliff basically in terms of the civic engagement piece and getting individuals uh, involved in the system. Now I, you know, I went to Westfield, and we have we had a. It was a turbulent time back in the, these are the uh, 70s and 80s, and we did a lot of things they don't do now on college sure. campuses. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the, uh, statute of limitation is good, right? <laughs> but we had uh, we had, we engaged Dr. Saviano, who was the president, then, mm -hmm. and I was head of the African American Society along with some other of my uh, colleagues, uh, some white folks, and we we had a we had a conversation with him. So young people have to find something you believe in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you read your history. You, there's plenty of examples who folks have come before you who have done things. Uh, 
it, it, it just takes the, the initiative to get involved and do something. Do something to make this society a better society or this campus a better campus. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you to demonstrate and march on Dr. Thompson. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying you should engage with uh, the professors here and, 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 the, and the students and the faculty and make a difference. And that's as, thank you for bringing up that George Floyd thing again, but that's what was so exciting is a lot of young people after that sure. all over the country. They were just doing and they were mm -hmm. just banging and challenging the system. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It's about, yeah, we don't like it. <laughs> people come mm -hmm. to Beacon Hill and they <laughs> demonstrate and march, but that's part of the American way. That's mm -hmm. the process. Sure. And young people, you have to engage, you have to get involved. You can't stay on the sidelines and just talk it. You got to get in the arena, get involved, do something. Go help somebody, the homeless, those who need uh, food, those who need uh, welfare, those who need help in the schools. Volunteer, just yeah. do something to make life a little better. I hope, wish they bring the Peace Corps back. Sure. I know I'm dating myself, <laughs> but that was when young Americans mm -hmm. went and got involved and they went all over the world to go help somebody. Mm -hmm. They did. Go to Costa Rica, go to Puerto Rico, go to Africa, go, go do something. You got youth, you got energy, mm -hmm. you got enthusiasm, <laughs> you do it. Do sure. it. Okay. I think to, to, to my brother's point, I think it's important for people to see um, and to attend and to listen to these, uh, these public hearings, right? There's mm -hmm. this thing called open meeting law. Uh -huh. And part of the open meeting law requires municipalities and every government entity to publish when they're having their meetings so that the public is aware. Um, so I would encourage people to, t to attend mm -hmm. and to watch mm -hmm. and to listen. Um, every city and town has boards and commissions for volunteers. I, you know, we're always looking for people to get involved, mm -hmm. to volunteer on, you know, whether it's a, a liquor commission or a parks commission or, mm -hmm. um, you know, several different boards and commissions that they, that they can volunteer for. And we're always looking for younger people to get sure. more involved in these boards and commissions. So uh, I would encourage people to look for those as well. Sure. So Those boards and commissions, I hear from so many uh, people in local government where they have a hard time finding people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are vacancies. Yeah. And by being involved, by doing, you learn. So uh, you don't have to know everything at first. You just have to want to do, yeah. uh, be part of it. Um, and uh, what you said earlier about the education, uh, I've had students who are really intelligent who just don't understand the government process. Mm -hmm. So the education has to start at the, lower, uh, the younger level mm -hmm. uh, where helping uh, children learn what this government is, how, how it represents them, how they can be part of it. And then from the university level, we can build on that. Sure. Do you have any one, uh, like a single thought, uh, final message that you want to share? Oh, there's so much. Um, I think for me to leave something, right, as they say, unpack something here, it's for the university to really look at the talent and the desire that's out in the community, such as the Izzy's of the world mm -hmm. that, you know, was looking for a place to continue his education mm -hmm. and had to do some searching. I think that there have been many students who have finished high school and maybe have gone to a community college um, for a short period of time and then have just kind of gone on to do the work, right? Mm -hmm. Because right now the economy is what it is and it is very difficult, um, one for parents to put kids through school mm -hmm. or for even kids to think about the daunting thought of walking away with a degree of you know $45,000 owed mm -hmm. and meanwhile and I've been looking at the at the ads. People want bachelor's degrees and paying fifteen fifty mm -hmm. an hour. Mm -hmm. How are you mm -hmm. going to be able to make your student loan on that kind of money? Sure. So I think that it's looking also at that other community that isn't always the one that's banging on your door mm -hmm. um, to be able to um, to join Westfield State. Sure. Final thought. Uh, I think the final thought for me is to leave with every. Uh, the, the university students, everyone. It's just like uh, professionalism for everyone looks different, right? It's not, uh, for me, it's fluid, uh, not for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I was, 
I was told at city council the other day that I shouldn't wear my hat in chambers. And I was like, oh my God, am I in high school again? <laughs> like, <laughs> and I like, but out of respect for, for, for the system, I didn't wear my hat, right? Mm -hmm. But I kind of felt like I should have worn my hat, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, this is what I got elected for, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what, this is the purpose, this is why I'm here. I'm supposed to take up the space and, and show that we don't all have to be the same to be able to be on the same levels, right? Like, I don't have to talk a certain way. I don't have to walk a certain way. I don't have to wear certain clothes. I, can, <laughs> I don't have to have my hair styled a certain way and still be a professional, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, for me, is like something that I try to put out there mm -hmm. so that people can understand that when you walk and in, run into someone and maybe they, they don't have the professional uh, etiquette, right? Mm -hmm. um, don't judge a book by its cover. Sure. <laughs> Final thought? Just, uh, I want to thank this distinguished panel, first of all, mm -hmm. and to you, Dr. Thompson. And I think uh, this is a critical mass, and I think it's uh, dialogues like this that we have with students on campuses that really are going to make a difference. Just so happy to have been part of this today, mm -hmm. and thank you for inviting me. Sure. Uh, thank you from from me as well. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, to be able to share some of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not you know not everyone understands the work that the sure. government mm -hmm. does and and what we do as a legislature. So um, for me, this is sort of the, the most enjoyable part of my job is to be able to talk to people mm -hmm. about what we do as a, as a government and uh, and the things that um, that I would like to do moving forward. So just thank you for the opportunity sure. for for having me tonight. Final thought. You can have really intelligent people in the room, and they're limited if they all have those same ideas, those same backgrounds, mm -hmm. the same experience. So it's such, so critical to have such a diverse group of people, people with different backgrounds, understandings. And when everyone's engaged, then we can tackle those hard issues, and we can be successful with it. Sure. So I'd like to thank each of our panelists today for a very enlightening conversation. Thank you to our uh, in-studio and virtual audience oh, yeah. for your thoughtful questions. I hope you will join us again on April 21st when we will explore economic and entrepreneurial equity here in Western Massachusetts. Among other panelists, we will have Rick Sullivan, President of the Economic Development Council with us. So until then. Thank you. 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 Thank you.